And we're back. Time to escape from another room. There are piles of crap everywhere. Man, this place is a mess. It's so messy, I don't know where to start. Some of this crap looks familiar. I think a lot of these are parts of the puzzles we've solved in the other rooms. If that's true, then this room could be Zero's laboratory. Perhaps Zero would shut himself in this room to devise the machines and puzzles he needs to see his plan come to fruition. Um... Hey, Junpei, isn't this a nautical table? Yeah, I feel like I've seen this somewhere before. New material's been added to the file screen. That's the nautical table we saw before. Nautical table from the study. Oh! It goes in reverse! Okay, so... Instead of this, you would go... South... West, Southeast, Northeast, East, North, East. Sinister music, yeah. The screen is huge. I wonder why it's blue. Maybe if I touch it. There's something on the screen now. What's this? There are 15 cells here with numbers and letters in each of them. Let me see that. Ah, oh, I see. So whenever you touch a shell, cell, the ones next to it turn on or off. Just gotta use it to make the all cells appear on the right and bottom in green. Um... Hey, Junpei, I found a piece of paper under that thing. You wanna take a look at it? Do you think this might have something to do with the puzzle? It's a piece of paper Clover gave me. There are a bunch of numbers and letters connected by equal signs on it. Just like she said, it's probably related to the puzzle on the screen somehow. Thanks, Clover. This really helps. <laughs> Alright, let's go back and try again. Anyway, it looks like I just need to make all the cells all green. Huh. A equals 10, so I need these to equal 10 somehow. Oh, did it! Well, that was easy. Saw what I wrote about pipes? Yes, I did. You did it, Junpei! You're so smart! You seem to have done an excellent job and solved the puzzle. That's what I would have expected from you, Junpei. Hey, calm down, you're embarrassing me! Whoa, whoa, don't get cocky, kid. We don't have time for that. Look at this. Check out the right edge of the control panel. The lid, the lid slid open, something came out. Cross emblem. A metal plate shaped like a shield. There's a cross engraved on it. Okay. Pipe. That's a pipe! There's a cabinet underneath it. There's a small cabinet underneath the pipe. Okay, I'm guessing not that pipe, then. The keyboard. Let's just tap a few keys, see if we can wake this thing up. Damn, no dice. Alright, I've put the emblems in the forentation desk, but... Huh? Nothing's happening. Wait, what's Snake doing? I feel symbols engraved just above each indentation. On the upper left is a steering wheel symbol. On the upper right is a cross symbol. On the bottom left, a mysterious circle symbol. And lastly, the waffle pattern is engraved near the bottom right indentation. Additionally, each symbol seems to have been given a number. One steering wheel, two cross, three mysterious circle, and four waffle patterns. One... Wheel, two cross, three circle, and four waffle. Perhaps we need to insert the emblems in the order. That order, huh? A mouse. Nothing happens when I mess with it, though. There are three monitors here. Power's on, but there's nothing on any of the screens. It's so small! I wonder what it is. I got no idea. I said there's a pipe in here. Pipe! A pipe. A pipe. A pipe. There are three pipes here. Give me a P! Give me an I! Give me a P and an E! What's that spell? Pipe! What the hell are we doing? There are three pipes here. Okay! I guess that's what it was. 
There's something written on these pieces of paper. Looks like we've got three sheets of this stuff. Morse code chart. Okay. Fun with pipes. Oh, is this gonna list how Morse code works? Yeah. Yeah. God damn it. The Morse code chart. It was found in a shelf in a small cluttered room. There's Morse code key, the letters A through I, the sharp mark is a dit, and the long mark is a da. Uh, I don't want to have to memorize Morse code. I don't want to have to write it all down either. What? What is this thing floating there? Uh, weird. Insulation fans. There are metal bars over the opening though, so we can't go through them. Uh, Lexiville, we found that one. <laughs> Don't worry, they told me. There are piles of crap everywhere. This is a pretty impressive mess. You try and search every one of these, we're gonna be at it till the cows come home. Well, that doesn't seem too bad. We don't have to go through and bring them in ourselves, then. Why don't you get smart with me, kid? Uh, how about we deal with this later, okay guys? Maybe we should try something more promising. My cat just jumped onto my lap and then onto the desk and scared the hell out of me. <laughs> The metal shutter looks pretty sturdy. It's framed with black and yellow warning stripes. I've got a bad feeling about this. I don't think we're gonna find a relaxing sunny garden on the other side of that thing. Oh, come on, what the hell are you so scared of? Let me handle this. Ah! <laughs> Damn it. Damn thing won't budge. I have to admit, I'm very curious about what might be holding the other side. These monitors hang down from the ceiling. Each screen shows a room on the ship. I don't suppose there's anything else to look like. The pipe. The side of the machine. The rust makes it feel rough. The card reader. It says lock. I'm not gonna be able to open this door until I find the card that goes with this thing. Actually, what's this? Damn it, looks like this thing's locked. It's not moving. Well, it's pretty obvious how we're supposed to open it. Oh no! The pipe. I missed the pipe? I don't get it. What'd I miss? I've talked to the pipe! I've done the pipe things! Oh, he missed the pipe. I see. Haha! <laughs> it's a sliding panel, just like the last one. Wonder if there's a plate with the emblem engraved on it here. Oh, I know how to do this one. Kirby did, not you. <laughs> Junpei, it looks like there's a compass on here. Ah, uh, now I get it. What do you mean? I guess you weren't there, Clover, but I solved a puzzle like this one on the wheelhouse. I think I just need to do the same thing here. The same thing? The important part is that this nautical table we found. I just have to match up directions to the compass on the lines of the nautical table. I use the steering wheel in the wheelhouse, but this time I think I'm going to use this wheel attached to the side here. Okay, then show me how! Of course. Maybe I ought to run through the instructions. This looks like it probably works the same way as the steering wheel in the wheelhouse did. If I just touch the directions I want to turn to, the compass will turn to that direction. Then I just gotta press stop when the compass is pointing where I want it to. I'm betting something will happen if I can do it right. Alright, let's do this. Alright. I want to go south. Oh, it shows me right there. It shows me on there. Okay, fine. Okay, then we want to go west. Oops. No, I messed it up. Uh, do I have to restart the whole thing? Because I did that? Uh, let's hope not. Southeast. Northwest. No, wait. Yeah, northeast. My bad. Then east. Then north. 
then east again. Okay, I goofed it up. I have to reset it. Alright. First is south. Then is west. Then is southeast. Then is northeast. Then is east. Then is north. Then it's east. And that'll do it. Ta-da! Yay, you did it, Junpei! Good boy! Who's a good boy? Ah, knock it off! Hey, we don't have time for screwing around right now. Check out the right side of the monitor. Just kind of slid open and something came out. Oh, yeah. I had a noise, too! Another big box in the hall by the exit? I think it made a noise. It's like something unlocking, you know? A noise, huh? Shell emblem. A metal plate shaped like a shield. The symbol looks like a steering wheel engraved on it. I think I get it now. The monitor is part of the machine. It's really dim though. It's got a map of the world on it, but I can barely see it. Um. Oh wait, this way. Oops. This way. Then it's weast. It's in a big box, right? Pile of junk. We don't have time to go through this. The metal shutter looks pretty sturdy. It's framed with black and yellow warning stripes. Alright, let's open it. Oh, holy shit! This is pretty damn creepy! There's a coffin in here! A coffin? A coffin? Oh man, does Seven think... Yeah, he's all pale. He's thinking the same thing I am. No way! Could this be... I'm sorry, but what's going on? It's a coffin! I wonder if there's a vampire in it! Right, I guess Clover and Snake don't know the story. Man, I can't bring myself to tell him. Well, at any rate, let's have a look around. There's a metal plaque on the coffin. Snake's touching it. All eyes. Oh, the two machines. Holy shit. Man, this is serious. Oh, well, let's open it, shall we? Well, if you'd give me a hand. Okay, I got it. Ready? Three, two, one. Ha! Huh. No luck. It doesn't seem to be ready to open. Yeah, but it's not like it's screwed shut or anything. Yeah, I believe it's locked in some other way. Hey, Seven, do you think you could open up with your superhuman strength? N no, I... What's wrong? I think I'll just pass on this one, okay? What the heck? Very well, we'll just have to give it up in the coffin for now. Let's look around the room a little more, shall we? Alice sleeps in a small chamber past the force of knowledge behind beneath the navel of the gigantic. Is this actually true? Okie dokie then. Back to puzzle solving. Let's see what happens when I... Whoa! Well, now we've got something on the screen at least. Huh? What is this? Oh, wait a minute. I saw something like this when I figured out that Morse code puzzle back in the communications office. Morse code? Yeah, the dots on here look like dits for a Morse code. There's two dots on the first line, four on the second, and one on the last. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, perhaps you should give it a shot anyway. Alright, I'll try. Before I do that, though... Hold on. Maybe you ought to run through the instructions. Dot, 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 and dot. We'll look those up in just a second. If I just tap the button, I'll enter a dit. If I hold the button down, I'll enter a da. Once we enter our answer, it'll be automatically determined if it was the correct answer or not. You can also switch to the code sheets I've got by touching the three icons over the right. Alright, let's do this. Alright, so... Two dots doesn't seem to be anything. Does it? But two dots and a dash is a U. And that's the only one that starts with two dots. Oh no, I. Sorry. That I works. So I... H... E is an option. Da 
That's not it, though. Okay. Hmm. If this was a U, would I be able to make anything? Is there anything that the four dots can be else? Can it be four dots something else? It cannot. So this is always an H. Hmm. Huh. Alright, so we can make a U with two dots and a dash, or we can make a V if we add another dash and dot, or dot and dash. Or if we add one, we can also make an S. She? Hmm. Or we can make an F. Let's see if she works. So, one, two, th oops, no! Oh! Okay! So it automatically skipped because the first one can only be anything with a two with two things. That means the first one's either I, M, N, or that's it. So I, M, or N. Next one has to be four. So next one is B, C, F, H. J L P Q. This is a lot of combinations. V X Y Z. V X Y Z. All right, and the last one is only the one, so it can either be a dot or a dash. So it's either T or an E. We don't have much in the way of vowels in the second row. Hmm. Met, bet, I can't make it- no, I can't make it me in the second row. Hmm. I don't see a word I can make with these. Um. No suggestions from any of the characters, huh? Well, maybe if I put these in the order as is. Let's drop the MM steering wheel in here. Oh! Whoa! Well, now we've got something on the monitors, at least. W what's that? Looks like some kind of puzzle. I wonder if these are the rules. Here, I'll read them to you. When you touch a numbered area, the area will be selected and it will turn blue to indicate this. Touching a numbered ball after selecting the area will cause the ball to be moved to that area. However, you cannot move the red balls. You can only move three to five balls in a single area. Oh, this is a test for the nomery game to see if, like, all the number combinations work. Press the check button once you have moved all the balls, except for the red ones when you cannot move, which you cannot move. Digital rule the balls in the area must match the number in that area. That's it. Uh, I still don't really get it. Whatever, like they said, practice makes perfects. Let's give it a shot. Don't you mean practice makes perfect? Hey, let's see you solve the next one. Then you can make fun of me. Alright, so three to five in each, and I need to- I can't move nine. Can I use this number? Wait! That's not a four! That's a seven! Oh, it is a four. It was just cut off for some reason. Alright, um... Crap! Digital roots! Uh... How do I access the calculator? I can't. Fuck. <laughs> okay. To get digital root of six, I need six plus nine. That'll do it. However, this will also do it. To get 3, I need to make a 12. 
8 and 7 is more than 12, so I could also use 21. So this would equal 15... Oopsies! Check. Combination will not open the door. 9 plus 15 equals 14, yeah. So... That only equals 21. Lame sauce. Okay, reset. Get digital root of this. I need... Oh, hey! There we go! Okay, this is it, right? But nothing's happening! There are still three more annotations left empty. I imagine something will happen when they're all filled. Doesn't that seem likely? Okay, let's put the emblem on the cross. Hey, Jimbei, something you showed up on the screen. This puzzle should look a lot like the last one. Yeah, but there's more of these red balls you can't move. Numbers for each area are different too. Looks like they've got the same rules as the last one though. You sure you don't want to double check that? No, I'll be fine. If I get confused, I can just look at the screen over here, right? Anyway, like you say, picture's worth a thousand words. Let's give it a shot. Isn't that a picture's worth a thousand words? Hey, shut it! At least I'm trying, alright? Okie dokie. A seven and one. I can't move one this time, though. Okay. Let's get a one. I either need ten... ...or twenty-eight. 10 or 28. Let's make it easy on my poor brain and just make it 10. Put everything else in the other. That's awesome, Junbei! There's only two left now. You can do it. I still need to find the other things, though. I don't know enough about the, the Morse code problem. Oh, hey! There's a piece of paper in here. Not sure without, uh, without taking a closer look, but I think it might be a clue. Junpei, we don't need this anymore, do we? No, I don't think so. Yeah, this is a puzzle we've already solved. This whole buttload of drawers in this cabinet. Oh. Oops. <laughs> it's for a puzzle we already solved? Oh, it is this one. <laughs> Whoopsie. I solved that one on accident. Look, Junpei! Rustin here looks like Elvis's face! Uh, yeah, how exciting. There's some old computer monitors on the desk. You don't see CRT monitors that much anymore. Gosh, this desk is really big and it feels really sturdy. Yeah, it does seem pretty heavy duty. I suppose it belongs to whoever uses this room, wouldn't you say? Alright, well I guess I have no choice but to do this. Have you figured out what you're supposed to do into here, Junpei? Uh, looks like the word that's supposed to go here has three letters. It's got three lines, and each line is one letter. I see. Well, if that's the case, then perhaps the letters you need are made up of two symbols, four symbols, and one symbol, respectively. After all, there isn't, isn't that what you just said. One line has two spaces, the next is four, and the last, last one is one. I see. So in other words, I've got to enter the dots or the dashes. Instead of two, then instead of four, then instead of one. Yes, that would seem. Maybe I ought to run through the instructions. I just tap the button and it'll enter a dit. It'll enter a da. Ice! The answer is ice! I got it! Okay! I. Uh, two dots. C. Got it! I see. It seems you have solved the puzzle, Junpei. Excellent work. The answer was ice. How did you know? All I had to do was listen to the sounds the machine made. After that, it was trivial matter to decode them. Oh, yes. I believe I heard a noise from somewhere to the right of the device after you solved it. I solved the puzzle. It sounded rather like something sliding open. Do you see anything that could have made that noise? Yeah, it's true. 
Oh yes, one more thing. I heard a sound from behind the shutter. Perhaps the coffin is unlocked now. What? Alright, fine. I'll open it. Okay, Junpei, you can do this. It's just a box. It's just a box. Oh, holy shit, this is a coffin. This is gonna be something horrible in there. I just know it. Okay, okay. Deep breath. Here we go. <laughs> oh, man, there's nobody in there. Shit, I can't believe I was scared of something like that. What do you mean, nobody? Were you expecting someone to be in there? Eh, it's a long story. That's Junpei about it sometime. Well, just like Seven said, there's nobody in there. There's something in there, though. Well, two somethings, actually. What is that? It's our key! And the shield. There are two things on the bottom of the coffin. Looks like we got a plate with an emblem on it, and... The Neptune key! Yes, we finally found it! Now we can get through the hallway! That's correct, Clover. But we do need to get out of this room first, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, let's get the hell out of here as quickly as possible! I don't have any objections, ob objections to that. I don't think we'll use the Neptune key in this room. It's really important though, so I'll keep it in my pocket for now. As far as the other thing goes... Coffin emblem. Alright. Back to the thing. So we can do the things. Next is this one. Let's put the emblem in the secret code. Lexiville, thank you for the follow. I appreciate it greatly. Damn, this puzzle looks a lot like the last one. Looks like the rules are the same, though. Don't you think you should double-check it? Come on, this is the third time I've done this. It'll be fine. So this, uh, um... If you can't think of anything clever, please don't strain yourself. You might hurt something. Ah, shut up! Just give me a break, alright? I'll think of something. Alright, seven and seven. This time I can't use the three. So, to make this, I need to make... Nope. Can't do that. There we go. Excellent work, Junpei. We've only got one left. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel. There we go. Let's see what happens when I put the emblem in the cough from the coffin in the indentation. This is the fourth one. This puzzle looks a lot like the last couple. I think this is probably the last one. Once we solve this puzzle, I'm sure something will happen. Alright, I'll solve it in no time. Eight and nine. Alright. Wait, what? Eight plus nine is supposed to give me seventeen, which should equal eight. Seven and two gives me nine. What the hell? That should work. That really should work. There's no way to do 8 plus 10. Not with this combination. What the hell? This works too, though. What? But these combinations work! Damn it, I just don't get this at all. The rules are displayed on the screen. Maybe I should read it again. Some kind of little machine. If I turn it upside down, it looks like a robot with its eyes popped out. The screen's showing me the ball puzzle and the instructions for it. Touching a numbered ball after selecting the area will cause the ball to be moved to that area. However, you cannot move the red balls. You can only move three to five. Oh, three to five! Right! Has to be three to five! That's what I kept mi mixing up. Digital root for the balls in the area must match a number for that area. Well, I guess these are the rules. Right, it has to be three to five. Okay, so to make that work... Wait a minute! I don't have that many balls! Oh, nothing had to be a nine! 
Huh? Where did that noise come from? Underneath the keyboard? Way to go, Junpei! You answered all the questions! Damn, Junpei, good job! Did you hear something about just now? Yes, I heard that as well. From the bottom left corner of the desk, I believe. A uh, picture? In the drawer was a single picture. He picked it up. There's a photograph of four men. That's definitely who I thought it was. Involuntarily, Jupe's eyebrow shot up. He'd seen three of them before. On the right was a man with a mustache. The same man they'd found murdered in the captain's quarters. That's Cap! Shit! You're right! He'd been wearing the zero bracelet when they found him. Second from the left was a man wearing glasses and a doctor's coat. It was the ninth man, the one whose bracelet number nine. He had gone into door five alone and met an unpleasant end. Finally, the man on the very left, the man with the pinstripe suit. Oh man, that's Ace! Yes, I guess it is. No doubt about it! Seven and Clover had come to peer over Junpei's shoulders. What did it mean? What was Ace doing in the picture? Perhaps more importantly, why was there ninth man and Cap in it as well? As Junpei looked closer, he noticed an expression on each man's face. Their smile suggested they were close, at least to some degree. But why? How? What was the relationship between these four men? Link's voice jumped broke into Junpei's thoughts. You say Ace is in that picture. Yeah, it doesn't look like it was taken recently, though. Ace, the ninth man, and Cap all took look about ten years younger. Ah, so the ninth man is the man you found murdered in the captain's quarter are also in the picture. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Well, there are only three people in the picture. I'm afraid I can't see it. No, there's one more guy. He's got kind of long hair. He looks smart, but a little cold. He's the only one I don't recognize. Hmm. Snake knit his eyebrows. What's the date of the phonograph? It doesn't have one. Did you look on the back? The back? Yes, the reverse, the other side. Junpei flipped the picture over. There it was. To be precise, it wasn't a date, but it was certainly significant. He read it aloud so that Snake could not be left in the dark. Praying for the success of the Nonary Project. With Nijisaki, Kubota, and Musashido. Nonary Project. Nijisaki, Kubota, Musashido. Junpei immediately flipped the picture back over. That meant that the four men in the picture had run the Nonary game nine years ago. Only Hongo had not been mentioned in the back, which Junpei felt meant that he had written those words himself. But what surprised Junpei was not this revelation, but the fact that it felt nothing like a revelation. It felt... obvious. That their true identities did not come as a surprise was what Junpei found most surprising. Why then? Why wasn't he surprised? <laughs> Junpei had not discovered, uh, had just discovered that Ace had run the Nonary Project, but... He felt no spark of excitement or surprise. Nothing. It was almost as if he'd already known. Ah, of course. I understand now. Junpei looked over at Snake. In his own confusion, he had missed the dark look on the man's other man's face. The last person. Was the last person in that picture the, the tenth man who got blown up in Snake's place? Oh my god, I think that's him. Ace was the CEO of Cradle Pharmaceutical. He was the one who invented the game nine years ago. He was Juntaro Hongo. Ace is Hongo? Even as he asked, Ju uh, Junpei felt as if he'd already known. It was as if someone had whispered into his head that yes, of course Ace was Hongo. I had my suspicions from the beginning. Their voices were familiar. Too familiar to be a coincidence. I could never forget his voice. It was the voice of the devil. Well, I kind of take offense to that. I couldn't be sure, though. After all, I had no way to check. I certainly couldn't ask him. Even if I had known, however, I would never have told you. Zero made it quite clear what would happen if I did. Oh my gosh, I had no idea! Huh? I didn't know Ace was Hongo! Oh yes, I suppose you wouldn't have. Nine years ago, you weren't building Q in Nevada. But Hongo was in the Gigantic with us. I know. That's why I didn't know what Hongo looked like. But why? Why didn't you tell me? I mean, I'm your sister, right? You could have told me. I'm sorry. I apologize for keeping this from you. If I told you, Clover, you would have been told everyone else. And if you did, then it would have been forced to tell them about what had happened nine years ago. I had to prevent that. Clover and Snake's conversation wasn't of particular interest to Junpei. He still couldn't make sense out of his strange feeling of knowledge. He was trying to organize his thoughts when he heard Seven's voice. Hey, Junpei. You think I can borrow that picture for a sec? He had no reason to say no, so Junpei handed the picture over. 
Seven stared at the picture and began to mutter the four names of the project's leaders over and over to himself. Hongo, Kubata, Nijisaki, Musashido. His brow was furrowed and his face was flushed. Hongo, Kubota, Nijisaki, Musashido. He chanted their names to himself, pacing back and forth across the floor. Hongo, Kubota, Nijisaki, Musashido. Seven shouldn't have known their names. After all, he hadn't been there when Junpei and Snake spoke of them in the library. As Junpei watched him pace, it was clear he did know of them. A seven, do you? Shut it! Just, just be quiet! His eyes were red and Junpei could see sweat beginning on a bead on his forehead. I'm this close to remembering! This close! He was sweating heavily now, but his lips were dry. Bungo, Kubota, Nijisaki, Musashido, Cradle Pharmaceutical, Nonary Project. And then he stopped. Seven set down the picture and looked at the red light near his feet. His eyes narrowed, and suddenly his eyes went wide and he shot up straight. Shit! What? What's wrong? Holy shit, this is nuts! Um, what's nuts? I remember. Remember what? Everything. Everything? Yeah, yeah! I remember all of it! My memory's back! I remember what happened before I got snatched! Seven's voice was filled with excitement. Shock and excitement had frozen Jubei in place, along with Snake and Clover. Let me tell you what happened. Snake hastily, uh, Seven hastily drew a shaking hand across his mouth and began to speak. Like Snake said, Haste is Hongo. From the right, there are three are Musashido, Nijisaki, and Kubota. Musashido was the man with the cash. Nijisaki was Hondo's right man, and Kubota developed the actual technical details of the experiments. Realization began to dawn on Junpei along with a pressing question. How do you know all this? Come on, man, I told you, I finally got my memory back. No, that's not what I mean. I'm trying to ask you why you knew all this stuff in the first place, before you forgot it. Seven rubbed the scar on his chin. You really want to know? Of course! Me too! Snake was the only one who didn't voice any sort of agreement. It looked as if Junpei, uh, as if he was simply waiting to see if Seven's recovery might take them. This is going to take a while. Now it'll probably take me a good three days to tell you everything. Well, we don't have three days. Just give us the short version, alright? Short version, huh? The big man pulled off his hat and scratched his head. Nothingness or six in Japanese. Ah, cute. Made a face and put his hat back on. All right, fine. I'll give it a shot. No promises, though. So. Junpei and Clover nodded earnestly. Seven was a lone wolf detective who valued his own code over the rules, doing what was right over what was doing what you were told. That was why on that fateful day he'd gone with his gut and gone to the wharf at night in the slim lead. It was nine years ago. The wharf had been dark, cold, and foreboding. At the time, he'd been investigating a spate of kidnappings, all of them children. They'd all taken- they all had one thing in common, a history of visits to one particular hospital. The hospital had been under the management of Cradle Pharmaceutical, and Simmons' investigation had turned up evidence that Cradle had been involved in the kidnappings. After a little persuasion, he'd managed to finally get a real lead from someone inside Cradle Pharmaceutical. They told him that, that night, a ship was set to take the children from where he had been held to a large passion lord ship docked offshore. Seven had, of course, gone to the wharf. Hidden in the shadows, he'd searched for the harbor, at least until it, until at last he found the ship he was looking for. So we've seen all this before in one of the other endings. There were a number of human shapes when we near their ship. They were men in black suits, many of them carrying large bags. The bags. There was something about the way they moved as they carried. They could be no mistake, there were human beings in those bags. So this is word for word the same thing. He mo moved before he even realized what he was going to, and in the shadows he came, his gun already in hand. He heard the words, don't move, but they weren't his. He felt metal touch the back of his head. Drop your gun, came the cold voice from behind him. I could kill you right now, it would mean nothing at all. I need only tie an anchor to your feet and I doubt anyone would see you for perhaps a week or so. Is that what you'd like? I wish they'd be thankful for the meal. With the words, he felt the cold metal thing behind him press against his skull. Slowly, Seven crouched down and laid his gun on the ground, and suddenly, felt a sharp pain in his neck. A needle. Was it some sort of drug? As he was thinking about that, Seven felt his face hit the cold concrete behind him, and feel the chill of it seeping into him. Ugh, damn it. Shit, my head hurts. Seven woke up and found himself lying on the hard floor. He twisted his neck to peer around the room. Where am I? There was a small shabby bed and a dirty sink. A toilet with no stall or privacy of any sort. As a cop, it was a place Seven had seen too often. So I'm going to 
try and skip some stuff and not keep talking because this is all stuff we've actually dealt with before. Good shove, then another, try pulling it. Honestly, I just kind of need to give my voice a bit of a rest. <laughs> not used to going this long. All right, this is him finding out he's locked in there. I still can't skip anything, by the way, because this is a different context for what's going on. So you got the scars during the first Nonary game? P possibly? Nonetheless, it was a voice as a high one, most likely a child. In the flashback, there are none. It's most likely got them trying to hit the kids out of the nonary game, is my guess. Or at least five or six, possibly more. Their voice is coming from. He looked around the room frantically. Perhaps it's the door. No, then he finds the vent. Was it coming from the left? Was it coming from under the bed? Grab the bed and flips it up with these. There it was. There was a hole for ventilation in the wall where their bed had been, covered with a metal grate. Seven lay down on his stomach and peered through the grate. Couldn't see anything. It was too dark. Now that he'd found it, however, there would be no doubt. This was the source of the voices. For a moment, he was confused. Why were there children nearby? They remembered that the man from Cradle Pharmaceutical had told him. How a ship would take the kidnapped children from the wharf to a waiting passenger liner out in the ocean. Was Seven on that passenger liner? It didn't matter. What mattered was that he found a way to, to be the children. Seven looked at the metal grate. Did he fit through that hole? He stuck his fingers through the grate and grabbed hold of it. Yep, can't open it. Oh, never mind. Got it open. I forgot that. Yeah, how do you like that, you son of a bitch? The dark square sat open before him. Seven wiped the sweat from his forehead and crawled inside. The first section of the duct was small. Seven could do little more than wiggle around on his belly. This is new. After a time, however, it got a little larger. Even someone as large as Seven would be able to crawl along on his hands and knees. He'd only grown for an inch, from an inchworm to an insect. Not much of an improvement, but it was better than nothing. he began to wonder if the duct would take him when... Oh no, we did see this part. There was a thunderous sound, like a massive metal door slamming shut. Then he heard a voice. Warning. Warning. Emergency incineration command has been acknowledged. Automatic incineration will take place in 18 minutes. Please evacuate the incinerator immediately. Repeat, emergency incineration command has been acknowledged. The voice wasn't harsh, but something about the calm at which it spoke was even more terrifying. Seven wasn't sure what it meant, but incinerator certainly didn't sound good. Then, almost as if to confirm his suspicions, he heard a chorus of young voices. No! Help me! Many of the voices were simply screaming in terror, mixing with one another to create a single horrifying howl. Damn it! What the hell's going on here? So he began to crawl through the duct as fast as his arms and legs could carry him. The noise he made was tremendous, but he was long past carrying. A few moments later, a metal door appeared on the left side of the duct. He seven could hear the screams of the children from the other side of it. This was it. He grabbed hold of the handle and threw the door open. The old metal gave way easily before his onslaught. What the? What the hell is this place? This was with the scene we saw before. When we were discussing his memory in the other ending, and I immediately recognized it as the incineration room. The room he was looking out and had a dome for a ceiling and nine equally sized walls. At the top of the dome was an upside down funnel. It looked almost like a chimney. Then he looked down. One of those definitely looks like Akane! There they were. The children he'd been looking for. They stared up at Seven, their cries silenced for a moment by surprise and fear. Whether they were scared of the room or him, Seven couldn't tell. It was certainly possible they were frightened of both. Not that I could blame them running into a mug like me when they're already scared shitless. He permitted himself a short snort of a laugh, then turned to the children again. Don't worry, kids. I'm not your enemy. I'm one of the good guys. Not a single one of them moved, except for one. He was a boy, slightly older than the others. Oh, God, that's Santa. In a private school uniform. Who the hell are you? As he spoke, he took a tentative step forward and gave Seven a suspicious look. No, wait! That's not right! If Akane died, his sister died, he wouldn't be in the same place as her, would he? Right? Huh. I'm a detective! I'm here to rescue you! 
The moment the words were out of his mouth, you could see the children relax. How are you going to help us? The boy in the uniform asked. Where's the exit? Seven responded. There isn't one. The doors we came in through don't, won't open, and the door over there... Cut himself off, considering something, and then continued. Anyway, there's no point. We can't all get out of... <gasps> oh, no. Oh, no. They're going to have to leave Akane behind. That's how they get through. Anyway, there's no point. We can't all get out of here. If we don't get out of here, we're going to be burned to death. Burned to death? Can't you hear it? The voice said the incinerator's going to start up soon. That's why he's here. I think he's going to blame Seven for this. I think Seven is part of the reason why they left someone behind. He had to save the rest of the kids. Oh, no. The voice spoke again. Automatic incineration will take place in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. They only had 15 minutes. Seven looked down at the children. Maybe we're making the wrong assumption here. Maybe Akane isn't Snake's sister. Just another girl. And Snake's sister died for a different reason, maybe. It was a good 20 or 30 feet to the floor. There's no way he could pull the children up. That was when he had an idea. Wait right there! I'm gonna be right back! What? Where is he going? Are you just going to leave us here? Seven did his best to smile what he felt was a re reassuring smile. Don't worry, alright. I'll be back, I promise. I said- I meant Santa's sister, sorry. Not Snake. Sorry. Wait! Snake! Either Snake- Snake must be there. Because he was the one in A. Was that- Is that not Santa? Is that supposed to be Snake? No. Wait, yeah! It could be Snake! His eyes just change color. Uh, hair just change color a bit. I know uh, this happens in real life because I used to be blonde. I don't color my hair. Unless it's Santa. I don't know. Don't worry, alright. I'll be back. I promise. Just stay calm and wait right there. Got it? He didn't wait to hear them respond. There wasn't time. He ran as fast as a man could run on his hands and knees. Before long, he was back in his cell. He was back where he had started, but he had a plan. There was something there he needed. As soon as he was finished, he dove back into the duct and took off toward the incinerator. Sorry to keep you waiting, guys. Getting out of the door in the duct, Seven lowered the rope he brought to the floor of the incinerator. The one on the left looked familiar, too. Uh, it's, it's, who are you, children? Back in the cell, he torn the bed sheets into strips and tied them together to make a rope. Like Seven himself, it wasn't very attractive, but it got the job done. Alright, let's just tie it around yourself, okay? I'll pull you up one at a time. Right! Huh? Wait a sec. That is when he noticed. There were more of you before. Where'd the rest of you go? The boy in the uniform answered. I let them go on ahead. We opened door number nine and they left. What? You're telling me you opened that door? That's what I said. Then what the hell are you doing here? We couldn't go with them. Why not? Look, the only people who can go through the numbered door... Automatic incineration will take place in five minutes. The voice reverberated against the walls of the room. Look, that can wait, alright? Just just get us out of here! R right Seven grabbed a hold of the rope. First up was the girl with the ponytail. Next was the girl with the red necktie, followed the boy in the jacket who he said he'd climb up on his own. The last up was the boy in the uniform. Like the boy in the jacket, he climbed up the rope himself. He looked scrawny from above, but his looks blind impressive strength. Uh, he scaled the rope quickly, but he was as he was almost to ooh, seven. They heard the sound of someone knocking. All eyes turned to the door. Cut into it was a thick square of a window. On the other side, they could see a furious face. God damn it, what's going on here? Why is the room empty? Where the hell are those fucking kids? The door opened and a man stepped in, looking half mad with fury. Seven recognized his face. He'd seen him many times in his photos during the investigation. The man's name was Jintaru Hango. 
then he would know who Seven was this entire time. Shit. The CEO of Cradle Pharmaceutical. Hongo saw the boy hanging from the rope. He roared like an animal and lunged for the rope. Hurry! I know! The boy in the uniform resumed his scramble up the rope. You son of a bitch! Get back here, you little shit! He was 15 feet away. 10! But when he came in arm's reach, 7 grabbed the boy in the uniform. With a jerk, he tossed him into the duct behind him. Gentaro. Sorry. Gentaro. Uh, no! Hongo had lost all semblance of control. His face no longer looked human. It was twisted into something terrifying. The visage of a devil or a ferocious monster. Seven quickly reeled in the rope, leaving a furious Hongo on the floor of the room, and crawled back in the duct. You fucking bastard! You won't get away with this! How dare you compromise this experiment! What experiment? Seven wondered. Automatic incineration and take place in one minute. Hey, old man, what the hell are you doing? Hurry up! It was the boy in the uniform. Seven tossed Hongo a taunting salute and pulled the door closed. There was no point in going back to Seven's cell, so they continued on ducting in another direction. After 30 feet or so, another duck met theirs, heading down. They nodded at one another, then turned and slid down the duck. A short time later, they crawled out of the duck to find themselves in a narrow hallway. There was a door on each side of it. The one on the left was a normal double door. But the one on the right was a familiar thick metal door with black and yellow stripes and a device next to the wall. On the door was a plate that read incinerator. And that's where we were? Yeah. Hongo might still be there. It looks like it's been shut off though. Wait, what? If he's still in there? Yeah, that's not good. Ugh. Seven grunted. Fine, the other door. Go into the other door. Hurry! The children began to run, with Seven falling closely behind them. On the other side of the door was a large spiral staircase. Run! Seven shouted. They didn't need to be told twice. Up and up and up they went, their feet pounding against the steps and their arms churned the air. Round and round they went like a human tornado. The stairway kept going. That's definitely Snake! Then this has to- this can't be Se- Are they doing the gender swap thing? Because this right there, that's pretty androgynous. They passed a couple of rooms that looked like dance halls when the boy in the uniform spoke. Uh, something's up. Akane's not catching up to us. Akane? My kid sister. The girl with the red necktie. You're not supposed to be in the same place, though. So you are Snake. But you're supposed to be an A if she's in Q. I don't get it. Akane? That was strange. So then you remember seeing that name on the list of children who'd gone missing. Hey, Akane! He cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled. There was no response. Maybe we outran her. Suddenly the boy in the uniform stopped short. Seven stopped too, as did the boy in the jacket and the ponytailed girl. When did we do that? Well, we passed a couple big rooms on the way here. Maybe she took a rest on one of them, eh? On one of them? No, that's impossible. Sorry, Grandpa. You keep going. I gotta go look for her downstairs. He turned to go. Hey, kid, wait! God damn it, I said wait! The boy didn't even seem to hear him. Fuck! Seven spun around and yelled at the, uh, to the boy in the jacket and the girl in the ponytail. I'm going after him! You two keep going, alright? You got it? The girl nodded and began to run up the stairs. The boy, however, I'm going with you. Seven didn't have time to argue. Instead, he simply nodded and took off down the stairs. The boy in the jacket followed. They ran all the way to the bottom floor, calling for her. Kane was nowhere to be found. God damn it, where the, where the hell did she go? The boy in the uniform couldn't hide his frustration. Help me! Somebody help me! It was a girl's voice. Akane! The boy in the uniform threw open the door and leapt to the, uh, into the hallway that faced the incinerator. Seven and the boy in the jacket followed. Seven couldn't believe what he saw. Hungo had grabbed Akane by the arm and was doing his utmost to force her into the incinerator. Come, come on, goddammit! Move! No, I don't want to! Let me go! 
Please let go of me! She had planted her feet squarely on the floor and was doing her best to get away, but Hongo was much larger than she was. She wasn't going to win. Akane! The boy in the uniform shouted. He roared with anger and charged toward Hongo. You came back! Ha! Ah, you're too late, idiot! Wait, what? Hongo lifted Akane bodily, bodily from her feet and threw her struggling into the incinerator. Ah! Before Seven or the boy in the uniform could react, Hongo leapt through the door after her. They saw him land inside. And then the door slammed shut with the finality of his great steel guillotine. The three of them ran to the door. This is impossible, though! Something has to change. Ace has to get out somehow. They pulled and strained and trying desperately to get it open. Fuck! It's no use. The goddamn thing won't move an inch. The boy in the uniform cried out and began to slam his fist against the door. He lit, hit it with such force, Seven Fears' knuckles would shatter from the impact. Akane! Akane! Are you okay? Help me! The voice was muffled by the door, but the sheer terror in it was unmistakable. What should I do? What should I do? I think I'm trapped in here. Where's Hongo? He went out the other door. Of course he did. Fuck. W what? Warning. Warning. Emergency incineration command has been acknowledged. Automatic incineration will take place in 18 minutes. Please evacuate the incinerator immediately. Repeat. Emergency incineration command has been acknowledged. Are you fucking kidding me? Oh, are you fucking kidding me? Someone was at a loss. It's the same damn thing. Are you there? The Connie's still always sounded close to tears. Yeah, we're here. Just hang on, alright? We're gonna figure out a way to save you. If she could have seen the bloodless face on the boy in the uniform, his words would have seemed a little more than a sick joke. How do you make it out the nine door? I'm assuming the admins can find can get through any door they want. Automatic incineration will take place in 17 minutes. Please! Please help me! I'm really, really scared! I don't want to die! Please, I don't want to die! I don't want to die! It's gonna be alright! I'll figure something out, I promise! I promise, okay? You hear me? I promise! I could hear her muffled sobs from the other side of the door. The boy in the uniform tightened his fists. His knuckles were bloodless white. Seven could tell that he was holding back tears of his own. It was silent. All they could hear was the creaking of the boat as it shifted in the water. They waited and waited, but Seven didn't continue. Uh, what happened then? Junpei couldn't wait any longer. He had to know. Seven looked at the floor. Come on, man. Put yourself in my shoes. It didn't doesn't end good. Think I want to remember that? Then, yeah. Sure, if I knew it was going to be like this, I almost wish I hadn't remembered. Seven shook his head. But there was something Junpei had to know. Hey, um, are you sure? Huh? Look, I don't want to ask this either, but there's there's something I don't get. So if you could just tell me, did that girl Akane really? Seven so stared straight ahead at nothing. Yeah, I'm sure. There wasn't anything we could do. After a while, the countdown ended. We heard something burning. We. Even after the fire stopped, they couldn't move. Seven and the boy in the jacket simply stood where they were, frozen. The boy in the uniform collapsed, falling to the floor in the jumble of limbs like a puppet whose strings have been cut. A few more minutes passed. The door opened. The boy in the uniform ran in, stumbling over his own feet. Seven and the boy in the jacket followed, still too numb to speak. The air in the incinerator was hot. Every breath made Seven's lungs feel like they were on fire. They are shimmered with heat. In the middle of the room, beneath the waves of heat. There it lay. The boy in the uniform walked towards it, his legs shaking violently. Seven couldn't see his face, but his body seemed somehow empty. Finally, he reached it. The boy collapsed to his knees, his legs no longer able to support him. I am not going to do that scream justice if I try and voice act it, so...
Junpei felt a cold lump form in the pit of his stomach. A feeling of sickening anticipation washed over him. He feel his body shivering. He desperately did not want to know the answer he feared he knew already, but he had to ask. He had to know for sure. Can I ask you one more thing? What? The girl, Akane. What was her last name? What does it matter to you? Just, just tell me, okay? Please? Seven looked at Junpei curiously and ran his tongue quickly over his dry lips. Kurashiki. Her name was Akane Kurashiki. Something inside Junpei stopped. He had, he had no more words left. He had no more Junpei left. He was just a shell of flesh and bone. Seven turned to Snake. You were there that day, weren't you? 